From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinion featured in JAMA. Hello, my name is Don Goff. I'm a professor of psychiatry at NYU Grossman School of Medicine and an associate editor at JAMA. I'll be hosting today's discussion of the article, Single Dose Psilocybin Treatment for Major Depressive Disorder, a Randomized Clinical Trial, with Dr. Charles Raison, who led the trial and is the corresponding author. Dr. Raison is Director of Clinical and Translational Research for the USONA Institute. Welcome, Dr. Raison. Nice to be here. Can you start by telling us about the USONA Institute, which funded the study? USONA Institute is a nonprofit medical research organization that was founded by Bill Linton in 2014. He decided to invest his resources into establishing this nonprofit medical research organization with the purpose of trying to take the data that was available at that time and push it forward into a series of studies that would support FDA approval if they were positive. Before we dive into the study, can you explain to the listeners why we need another antidepressant and why psilocybin? Why do we need another antidepressant? There's two large reasons, I think. One is that many, many people do not get an adequate response to the antidepressants we have currently. Almost certainly more than half the people that are really struggling with depression do not get a remission with currently available agents. And when they get it, they tend to lose it. So that's one reason, that we need something for the people that are not responding to our current treatment. And one of the exciting things about what we're doing at USONA is that we're pursuing an indication for major depressive disorder, not just treatment-resistant depression. People argue about the numbers, but a large number of people that initially respond to antidepressants lose that response. So something like psilocybin, which produces a long-term antidepressant response after a single treatment may be a different way of approaching it, right? You give it early in the course of the disorder, people then have this sort of change in their affective state that allows them to perhaps move through life without having to take an antidepressant every day and perhaps avoiding that situation where people end up with long-term chronic antidepressant use. Why psilocybin? It is a potent psychedelic agent. Years ago, when I asked the same question, of the people who did the early studies, they laughed and they said it wasn't LSD. It didn't have as much baggage. But there's other reasons why it's attractive. It doesn't produce as long or intense a psychedelic experience as things like ayahuasca or LSD. So it's a little bit more user-friendly that way while still seeming to promote this powerful antidepressant effect. In terms of the development of psilocybin, how does this study fit into that overall trajectory? Psychedelics kind of came in backwards. Instead of doing sequential, larger and larger studies that you do in a a typical development program for a new agent, there were already about a thousand studies of psychedelics from the 50s and 60s. And so because there was so much stigma when psilocybin began to reappear into the research world in the early 2000s, at first it was done in these very small academic studies. And for a number of years, the studies were only on healthy volunteers. We were not looking at people that had any sort of a psychiatric condition. After that, then there were this series of small studies, first in cancer, people that were depressed and anxious and facing a life-threatening cancer. Again, small studies, placebo-controlled, showing this long-term signal. And then there were a couple of smaller studies in people that had either treatment-resistant depression or MDD, major depressive disorder. These are all small studies. The largest of them had about 50, 60 people. More recently, Compass Pathways, which is also developing psilocybin as a treatment for treatment-resistant depression, has now done a much larger study. The study that we're going to talk about today, our study, fits into this pattern that it is the first large FDA-type phase 2B study of psilocybin, not just for treatment-resistant depression, but in fact for major depression more broadly. And so that's really what's unique about it is that it was done to FDA standards. For the field, it's a larger study sample size, and it's looking at major depressive disorder, not treatment-resistant depression. And before we get to the findings, I wonder if you could uh, give us a brief description of the design, because as you've described, psychedelics are a radical departure from what we're used to with antidepressants, meaning daily dosing, delayed response over many weeks. Typical antidepressants are much easier to blind in these studies. So if you could describe the design that you used, which is really quite innovative. 
Much of the design in our study derives or is reflected by or is consistent with prior studies had done in terms of how the psilocybin was delivered. But this is what we did. We recruited for people that had major depressive disorder. We did not require them to be treatment resistant, nor did we exclude them if they were treatment resistant. So we took the whole gamut of depressed people across the average age range. In this study, it was 21 to 65. When we started, we had more concerns than we do now about people younger than 21. They're screened. They met eligibility criteria. They had a baseline assessment. They still had to be depressed enough to qualify at that baseline. And that was sort of where the start was for measuring the antidepressant response. Baseline, then within seven days, they have to be dosed with a high dose of psilocybin, 25 milligrams, or placebo. And the placebo we used was actually niacin. And niacin has a history in psychedelic research because there's this idea that it produces some flushing, a little bit of a physiologic response. It may aid with blinding. And as you've alluded to, there's some real challenges there. But before people got to psilocybin, they also got six to eight hours of what we call preparation work. And this involves meeting with the two facilitators who are going to attend the patient in the dosing session. And during those six to eight hours, they get to know the patient. They review with the patient sort of what they might expect. So there's some psychoeducation. They review with the patient, the patient's history with depression. They explore what the patient hopes to get out of the treatment, whether the patient gets the active treatment or the niacin placebo. And they're also looking to see if they can establish rapport to get a sense that this is somebody that they feel safe delivering psilocybin to potentially because psilocybin psilocybin is very potent. So then on the dosing day, subjects came in and they had a 50-50 chance of getting either a single 25 milligram psilocybin tablet or a capsule or niacin. They swallow it. We encourage them then to lay down generally on a couch or a bed and encourage them also to wear eye shades so they're not distracted by things in their environment. The dosing session lasts between six and eight hours. When it's over and people are safe, they go home. We see them the next day. We offer them what's called an integration session, meaning that we spend two hours going over with the participants. What did the experience mean to them? What stood out? What didn't stand out? A supportive interaction with the patient. And then, of course, we did assessments of a variety of behavioral outcomes after the dosing. We looked at a couple of things the day after. We looked a week later, two weeks later later, four weeks later, and six weeks later. The six weeks post-dosing was the primary endpoint of the study. And the primary outcome was change in depressive symptom score as measured by the Montgomery Asberg Depression Rating Scale, which is pretty much the standard thing done in the field. And importantly, to your point about blinding, it's very hard to blind a psychedelic experience. And as far as we know, things that produce psychedelic experiences also have antidepressant effects. So what we did do was that we had all the MADRAS assessments done by centralized off-site raters who did not know who the participant was, did not know which treatment the participant got. And I think really importantly, did not know where in the trial any given participant was. I should mention for listeners that this is not mushroom-derived psilocybin. This is psilocybin synthesized in a laboratory under FDA standards. And then, as you said, very labor-intensive. So my reading the paper, there was a doctoral-level clinician, a second clinician, who spent a total of 22 hours each for one treatment session. So quite an intensive process. How about uh, sharing the findings with us, the main findings? The psilocybin produced a rapid, robust, and sustained antidepressant response. And so basically, from where they started at baseline to six weeks later, the folks that got that single 25 milligram dose of psilocybin on average had a 19.1 point drop in the madras. The folks that got the niacin comparator had a 6.8 point drop. So there's about a 12.3 point difference between the two. And it's interesting, of course, a placebo response of almost seven points on the madras is what other studies have seen in the psilocybin space. It's not as large a placebo response as you usually get with, say, a pill placebo that you take every day. There, the average placebo response is about a reduction in 12 points. But our 19 points is still much larger than that. So this was a large scale reduction. We also looked at sustained response and sustained remission. These are pretty robust metrics because it means that you've got to hit that metric at every post-dosing visit. So to get a sustained response, you had to be in response one week, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, 
Same thing with remission. We had 41% of the folks that got to psilocybin, they were in response at every post-dosing visit compared to 11% of the people that got to niacin. That was very statistically significant. We just missed statistical significance on the sustained remission. There we had 25% of the people that were in remission at each post-dosing time point with the psilocybin compared to only 9% with the niacin. So at the six-week endpoint, basically 60% more or less, of the people that got psilocybin had had a response, meaning they'd had a 50% reduction in their starting score. And 44% of them were in remission, meaning that their score had dropped to a level that it's close to how people function when they're not depressed. And this is very different than the niacin. Only 20% of the niacin people had a response at week six, and only 11% of the niacin people had uh, remission. And can you tell us about side effects? The good news about side effects with psilocybin is because the drug's only in the body for six hours or so, the side effects tend to be very time limited. So almost all the side effects occur on the day of dosing, and they're mostly resolved within a day afterwards. The most common side effects were nausea, headaches, and then visual effects. You know, people see these sort of hallucinations, they see patterns. There were some people that had anxiety. That is not uncommon also because this experience is so intense. But in general, the side effects resolve within a day. The headache will sometimes last into the next day. But the treatment emergency side effects had by and large resolve within a day or two of dosing. And there were no serious adverse events related to dosing. And serious means you died or you went to the hospital or those sort of very kind of cataclysmic outcomes. So the overall safety profile, as in most prior studies of psilocybin, was generally benign. Largely no persistent side effects and no serious adverse events. And we didn't see any increase in suicide. We didn't see any suicidal behavior and we didn't see any type of increase in suicidal ideation, which is also encouraging. And in the past, there were real concerns, particularly with LSD, of persistent visual disturbances. Could you say anything about that? Yes, that is a real thing to watch for. There were a couple people, one person, maybe two people, had a little bit of self-reported visual disturbance is a strong word, but feeling that there was a little bit of a carryover in a day or two after. There was one participant who endorsed that for nine days afterwards. That's something to watch. It wasn't significant enough that they required any sort of intervention or anything like that. But these agents, they can sort of stay with people, and sometimes people will get a sense of immediacy about the psychedelic experience they've had that can also make people feel like they're back there. So you saw a robust effect first seen on day eight after administration, and there was very much a plateau for the subsequent five weeks separation, some patients showing response continuously and even remission for five weeks. And that effect as big or even larger than what has been previously seen for the most part in the psilocybin studies and comparable or greater than most medication antidepressant trials. Is that correct? Yeah, Don, what you said is exactly right. And that word plateau is really interesting because that is, in fact, what happened. Most of the antidepressant effect was apparent within a week after dosing, but the effect did not decay over the subsequent five weeks. Some studies in treatment-resistant depression have actually seen the effect begin to fade a little bit over a six-week period. We did not see that. In fact, numerically, it increased. So this is really striking. The overall effect was larger in terms of reduction in MADRA score than is typical in antidepressant studies. But I think what's really amazing is that you can do a single treatment of an agent that's in the body for six hours, eight hours in many people. And on average, in the group as a whole, you get this really sustained antidepressant response. I think that's, to me, the most fascinating finding about this study. Let me just mention a few limitations, which are noted in the paper, and I think it's important for listeners to be aware of. First, this treatment, although well-tolerated, was not without side effects. Fortunately, no persistent, serious side effects have been observed, but with a sample of roughly 50 people, we really will need much larger trials to identify uncommon, more serious side effects. The other potential limitations is the sample was not representative of the U.S. population, meaning tended to be white, non-Hispanic, and the annual incomes skewed towards the higher income brackets. I think the use of niacin was a very clever idea, the use of remote raters, but I assume one needs to acknowledge, particularly in the absence of querying subjects at the end of the study, whether they thought they got 
psilocybin versus niacin that we really don't know how successful the blinding was. Would you like to say anything about those? Yes, for sure. Psilocybin did have adverse events. It can produce very powerful experiences that people can struggle with. So we will see more adverse events as the field expands. That's just the way things go. There's a lot more we need to understand about that. The blinding is absolutely a challenge. We did not assess how well the blinding worked. This will be something that all studies going forward are going to do. The FDA is now very interested in this. And studies that have asked about the blinding, there was a recent study by Michael Bogenschutz and colleagues at NYU for alcohol use disorder. The subjects and people that were in the room with them were able to guess with very high accuracy. So blinding is a real challenge. And there there may not be a way in these sorts of trials to stop that other than noting it and seeing what the association is between correctly guessing what you got and how large a response you get. And then it is absolutely essential that as a field, we diversify our participant ethnicity and racial makeup. We're deeply committed to doing that. And I know the other entities in the field are also very deeply committed. That must happen. So that's part of what we and others will work on assiduously as we move into phase three. Final comment, what advice would you give to clinicians when patients come to them having heard about this study and similar studies eager to try this new area of treatment? That is a tough one because these substances are still federally Schedule One illegal substances. As you noted, although the data set for these agents is expanding, it's still fairly small. There's a lot we don't know, and there's a lot we don't know about how to optimally use these agents in many ways. On the other hand, while we've been doing this and pursuing an FDA route, both Oregon now and Colorado have legalized the use of psilocybin in constrained ways, but that is now an option for people. You can actually go someplace in the United States and pay to have a psilocybin experience. We don't know yet whether that will be as effective. We don't know what the risks for that will be. I mean, that's something time's going to tell. But the landscape keeps changing. When I started doing this, I would tell people, oh, no, you know, these, these are illegal substances and we know almost nothing. Now we know more. And there are places in the United States where you can legally go get a curated experience. I think we're a couple of few years away from it being FDA approved and available that way. So it's hard. We had thousands of people on our waiting list wanting to get into the study. We desperately do need something like these new agents because there's a huge unmet need. Thank you again for joining us today, Dr. Brisson. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Rachel Yehuda, who is Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and directs both PTSD and psychedelic research programs. Dr. Yehuda and Dr. Amy Lerner wrote the editorial that accompanies the paper by Dr. Brisson and colleagues. The editorial is titled Psychedelic Therapy, A New Paradigm of Care for Mental Health. Doctors Yehuda and Dr. Lerner are at the James J. Peters VA Medical Center in the Bronx. Welcome, Dr. Yehuda. Thank you. It's great to be here. Can you start by sharing your thoughts on the results and implications of the trial presented by Dr. Rezong? Yes, I thought that the trial was fascinating and it was done very well. The results showed that patients had sustained their gains that were observed as early as eight days after the psilocybin, well into 43 days later. So I thought that was really exciting. We discussed with Dr. Rezon the potential limitations. One is how successfully can one mask a psychedelic, you know, even though niacin, of course, is a clever act of control. And then also, what can we conclude in terms of tolerability and, more importantly, safety? Yeah, I mean, there are always going to be limitations with every study design, and we can choose to focus on those limitations, or we can focus on the signal that we're getting and the encouragement to continue doing greater and greater studies. So I think that the issue of whether or not there is a true placebo control ability in psychedelics has been a question that many people have raised. Using a drug that kind of does something, even if it's not a full-blown psychedelic effect, seems to be a step in the right direction. These trials have been small. That's because it's so hard to do this work. And as you could see from the paper, thousands of people were screened, right? Probably thousands of people called until they could get the required number of people to be in this trial. A lot of people screen out for a variety of reasons. So 
these are relatively early days in doing these kinds of trials. The important question is, should we continue to invest in this approach? Are we getting a strong enough signal? Is it promising enough? Should we invest our time in learning more about this? And I think the conclusion from this study is, yeah, let's invest our time to see what this is all about, because this might herald a new way of dealing with an intractable problem. As you noted, this approach is really dramatically different in terms of a single dose producing a rapid and sustained effect, really unlike other antidepressants. Do you have any thoughts on potential mechanisms that might explain the effects of uh, psychedelics? Yeah, I have some thoughts about it. I think that one of the things we tried to do in our commentary was emphasize that we're not just looking here at a single dose of a medicine. We are looking at taking a psychedelic drug, in this case psilocybin, in the context of a plan to improve depression. There's a lot of preparation that occurs before taking the psilocybin. There can be facilitation during the session. And then there's a process of integration where we help patients kind of make sense out of the experience that they've had. So I think one of the things that's radically new about this approach is that it is really combining the power of a pharmaceutical, a drug that can change the brain and activate receptors and bring about a lot of different neurochemical events. And we're harnessing it with being in the right frame of mind, having an intention to deal with your mental health problem, and using the altered state as a way to gain an insight to embark on introspection. When we're talking about mental health syndromes like depression, like PTSD, like anxiety disorders, there's definitely a biochemical component, but there's also an existential component. And so what I really like about this approach is that it brings the the psyche back in psychiatry. It reminds us that healing occurs in the context of both addressing the biologic dysregulation and allowing a process where somebody can start to see something in a different way and have some ideas and thoughts about it that might galvanize a deeper healing process. Thank you. And that model you describe, as you noted, applies to more than depression in terms of these fundamental psychological processes. You want to say more about the breadth of psychiatric disorders that potentially are worth studying? One of the most exciting features of the psychedelic-assisted therapies is that they are transdiagnostic. Transdiagnostic for not only mental health, but they may even reach into some sorts of psychosomatic medical illnesses. People are also thinking about the potential of psychedelics for migraine headaches or other kinds of pain disorders or things like that. But the idea of saying that the treatment is transdiagnostic is that we're not trying to look at specific features of the illness or specific symptoms of a particular condition, but we're more taking a 500-foot overview into the despair, the distress, the impairment in function, the hopelessness, the helplessness, the sense of shame, the sense of not feeling complete that people with mental health conditions experience, the not belonging, the idea that you're letting everybody down in your life, that you're not pulling your weight, that there are all these things going on that are the result of having mental health symptoms. So you don't just have a symptom, you have a feeling about that symptom. You know, sometimes people find themselves feeling ashamed that they are depressed because they don't understand why they should be depressed when certain objective features in their lives might be good. And so you can develop a lot of feelings about your symptoms and your suffering from the symptoms themselves. The idea of being in an altered state is that it allows you an opportunity to perhaps look at something in a different way, to perhaps feel a connection to others or to the universe that has been missing, to feel less alone, to kind of galvanize something more in a spiritual and even perhaps mystical range that kind of brings you back to yourself or that gives you the feeling that you can change, the impetus to change, and also the knowledge that you can change or the hope that you do not have to be 
in this state forever. So there are a lot of different components to it. And I think that some of the biologic changes that occur when you take a psychedelic help loosen things up so that change becomes a possibility instead of this idea that you just feel stuck in it and that it won't be different tomorrow. And that's where the deep hopelessness comes in. And that's where some of the treatment resistance may also find itself just in this idea that tomorrow's going to be the same as today and that there's little hope. And you start by saying that despite limitations of sample size or challenges with masking the treatment, that the important issue is really the signal of rapid and sustained antidepressant treatment strong enough to warrant future research. What should that future research look like? Well, the future research um, should look like more clinical trials and thinking about ways to design them better, to make them larger, to think about what the true outcome variables look like, what are the other kinds of outcomes that we would feel make for a successful outcome, a change in worldview. Perhaps the patient can start doing things that they didn't think were possible. And one of the things that's really missing from our database is what happens over the long run 43 days isn't the long run, 43 months. Now that's a different issue. So we don't know a whole lot about really how sustained the effects are, whether people will feel the need to do these therapies again, how long will it be before they want it again? So the question here is really whether we're shifting a mindset, which ostensibly could be enduring, or whether we're suppressing symptoms that are going to kind of creep back up when whatever biologic change we've made with the drug just stops working. So I think these are the questions that we have. I am hoping that what is really happening with psychedelic therapies is that it promotes a change in your mindset that then can stick. And I know that changes in mindset can stick because many people have mental health symptoms because an adverse event shifted their mindset. So the way you look at the world can change in an instant, and it can be very enduring and sometimes permanent. I think that an episode of treatment can also have positive, enduring, transformative effects. That's the hope here. And there's also a beautiful opportunity to understand the neuroscience of this and to understand what is it that makes people in a better state of mind? And what are the biologic correlates of that? What are the mental correlates of that? So we have here tools that will help us understand consciousness better, but we also have tools that might be important for mental health. I think the most important thing is to not make the mistake that this is just another pharmaceutical this is a pharmaceutical that is being taken for a purpose in a specific context. The same medication, psilocybin, when used recreationally and without the intention of healing and not in the context of a therapeutic container, will not get rid of mental health symptoms. That will be a very different pharmacologic experience. Thank you. This has been Dr. Don Goff for the JAMA Network. I'd like to thank Dr. Yehuda and Dr. Rezan for joining me to discuss the potential impact that psychedelic therapies might have on mental health care. This episode was produced by Shelley Steffens at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening. For more information about Pacific Treatment and Research in Psychedelic Center, visit pacifictrip.org.